Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's cut straight to the chase today because I like doing that. This is one of those hard yet strikingly simple Sundays. Like, do you know what I mean? This is one of those Sundays as a preacher that you go, this is easy. We're talking about the gospel. And yet, it's not that easy because there's a whole lot of misconceptions and, and thoughts and simplifications and chaos that we do with this thing. And not the least of which is the fact that we are in this binge reading the Bible series where we've been taking big chunks of scripture, genre by genre, and we've kind of been going through them. We've looked at some historical books. We've looked at wisdom literature. Last week, Pastor Mark took us through the prophets and, and what role does that play in the scriptures. And now we come to this simple yet a little confusing section um, right at the beginning of the New Testament that we call the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That these four books that tell us about Jesus, that they tell us about the fact that God took on flesh, walked among us, and ultimately died for our sin, that, that our life is now hidden in Christ Jesus, that, that there is life in his death. And that's a beautiful thing. That, in, in a nutshell, is the gospel. And yet, that's not to be confused with the gospels, these four books of the Bible. I, I was on a trip to Kansas City uh, a few years ago. We met with some pastors there, and one of them stood in front of our group and said, listen, men, because he was speaking to all pastors, listen, men, the, the only books of the Bible that you should read are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You, you should just dwell in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's all you should read because those are the Gospels. That is, that is where we see God. That's all you need in all of Scripture's. How would you respond if that was said to you? If I stood up in front of you today and said, you know what, all this, rip it out. All this, rip it out. All you need is, I want to make sure I'm being honest with you, that. How would you respond? Is that all you need? Can the entirety of God's word be summed up in, in just these four books? Maybe a secondary sentence. Can, can the entirety of the scriptures be summed up with just simple little sentences like, Jesus saves? You ever heard that one? Jesus saves. Maybe you've been driving on the freeway, you pass under an overpass, and there, spray painted on the bridge, it says, Jesus saves. Is that the gospel? Who's Jesus? By the way, what does he save you from? How, how do you know the answer to that question or those questions? How do you know who in the world Jesus is? Because the world would certainly like to take Jesus and morph him into a whole bunch of stuff. You know, he's a good old boy. Jesus, he, 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 he spoke truth. Jesus was a social reformer. Jesus valued the downtrodden. He was a community organizer. Jesus was a rebel. He overthrew governments. Are all those true? Kinda. Right? Who's Jesus? And, and, and what does he actually save us from? See, this is the complexity of the scriptures. Some of us, I, I've heard this more times than I can count, would like to say, no, we don't need any of the Old Testament. All we need is the New Testament. And as I've already said, some of us even take it a step further and we say all, all we need are the Gospels or all we need is Jesus. And while in a sense that's true, the message of Jesus is terribly incomplete without the backstory, right? Like Jesus doesn't make sense to the world. 
You can't be that person who goes to sporting events with your sandwich board and have written on it, Jesus saves, and expect anyone to respond to you, at least not positively. You know why? Because that's packed with insider language. It's, it's laden with the assumption that people that you're trying to connect to actually know the backstory. But the reality in the world we live in today is people don't know the backstory. People don't know that they, in fact, need a Savior. If I were to ask you, Jesus saves you from what? Most of you in unison, let's try this, let's see if I'm right. Most of you in unison would respond with one word. Jesus saves you from Sin, what does that mean in the world today? What does it mean? What is sin? See how complicated this gets? Jesus saves us from sin. Great. Do you, are you aware that most of the people you're going to attempt to talk about Jesus with in the world don't really acknowledge that they're sinners? In fact, they probably most of them don't have an operational theory of what sin is. You know how you learn what sin is? You, you, you read this. You learn that God created everything perfectly, right? That, that's what you learn in the scriptures. You learn that God wanted a relationship with humanity and we broke that relationship. That's what you learn. You learn that then God stepped in and revealed part of his plan that was he was going to set up a super secret special relationship with some people. That that's what God was going to do. He, he wasn't just going to broadcast himself to the whole world. No, he was going to take Abraham and Abraham's descendants, Israel, and he was going to make them into a great people. And through them, he was going to bless the whole world. That, that God was going to work through creation to restore creation. That, that's what you learn. You learn. That even though God set up this special relationship with his people, his people were pretty jacked up. His people loved to rebel and blow things apart and make mistakes and be unfaithful. That, that's what you learn. And yet you learn that God, in the midst of all of that, was faithful to his promises. He always oriented his people, Israel, forward to the day that he would come. And that he would once and forever restore them. That's what you learn, right? In, in other words, sin is not a list of do's and don'ts. I've said this before. I'm going to say it a thousand times until we get it. We've got to stop talking with our unchurched people using the word sin. And we've got to stop talking to them as though sin is a list of things they have made mistakes of in their life because that will automatically generate a discussion of what should or should not be on the list. Sin is a position. It is us turned away from the Father. That's what sin is. It's us turned to ourselves, wanting to please ourselves rather than acknowledging that He is the one who creates and sustains all things, that He sets what's right and what's wrong, not us. That's, that's sin. It's, it's a turn inward. So what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to turn us back to the Father. Jesus came to puncture sin, to pierce it, to walk us back through our own self-centered obsessions into the presence of a Father. That's what the gospel is. But we only get there if we read the rest of this, right? We only get there if we see a need for this promised one, Israel reduced to one person, all of God's people reduced to one singular person, Jesus, who finally did what God wanted done. It's the only way we get there. And we read about Jesus in these four books called the Gospels, little g. And they tell us about who Jesus was and what Jesus did. Um, interestingly, I want you to, for those of you who take notes, I want you to grasp that the beauty of the Gospels, you know why there's four of them? Anybody want to take a stab? Because we didn't get it right the first time? Is that why? It took us four tries? 
No, there are four of them because three of them are written to different audiences, and the fourth one is a, is a definitive play on, on Jesus being one with the Father. Matthew is written to Jude. Written. Man, that was classic right there. Matthew was written to Jews. Because God wanted Israel to recognize that finally he had come in the flesh to claim them back. That, that's why Matthew's written. It's targeted at Jewish people. Mark is written to Romans, these intellectual leaders of the day. Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is written to, Luke is written to um, Greeks the philosophers of the day. And so if you read that, you'll, you'll pick that thread up. And then John sums it all up by repetitively, it is the theme of John teaching us that God the Father and Jesus Christ are, are one, that they are, they are not separate, they are one God. That the divinity of Jesus is tied to the divinity of the Father. So that there's no doubt that this is God working, not just claiming some nifty guy for his purposes. There are four Gospels because this message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ was supposed to be available to everyone. To everyone. No matter what your language, what your culture, what your philosophical bent, it was meant for everyone. And so we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and we piece together leader Jesus and philosopher Jesus, Greek fulfillment Jesus, Jesus the Son of God. We, 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 we see the fullness of God in the flesh who fulfilled all of this when we couldn't, right? The cyclicalness of the scriptures are that once we see God clearly in Jesus in the four Gospels, we then get to go back in the Old Testament and we get to see that the Gospel, the hope that we have in Jesus, is laced throughout all of the Old Testament scripture. That the, the, the Gospel is not just found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the Gospel is found throughout all of scripture. The difference is God's people, Israel, looked forward to the fulfillment of this promise. They didn't know all the details, but they knew that God was going to do something, and they put their trust in him, their faith in him, and they looked forward to what God was going to do. And then Jesus came as the fulfillment of all of those, hope, all of those hopes. But the story doesn't end with Jesus either. We now live on the other side of Jesus where we get to look backwards and we get to see that Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment of everything God had planned. That Jesus is the plan. That Jesus is everything God wanted done in the world, done perfectly. We get to see all of that looking backwards, but we don't live looking backwards. We live looking forward. See, that's the crazy part for us on this side of the resurrection, on this side of Jesus. It is we're now called to go back and be the people of God that he established all the way back with Abraham. God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to work through my people to restore all things. And then he does that in Jesus. And then Jesus reestablishes those people. They're called the church. New Israel you, the people that God has claimed to now carry a specific message of hope to the world, a message rooted in the story of Jesus. That, that's what we're called to as his people. Thus Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, I have not come to fulfill the law, or to abolish the law, rather. I've come to fulfill it. I've not come to destroy it. It hasn't gone anywhere. No, that plan of working through people to carry hope to the world is still in, in place. What's gone is the lack of being able to accomplish it. No, in me, in Christ Jesus, it is perfectly accomplished. And from this moment forward, all of my people will climb on my back, and, and the fulfillment will be mine for them. That the perfection that God seeks will be mine for them. The desire to have things a certain way will be mine for them. That's the message of hope that we have. That's the gospel. 
that everything we see in Jesus is ours when we're bonded to Jesus. Which generates the next question. What does it mean to be bonded to Jesus? What does it mean to be gospel people? That, that, that Jesus is more than some kind of eternal insurance policy that we keep in our wallet and someday our relatives can find it after we die. Right? Being bonded to Jesus looks radically different than what most of us want to tweak and morph it into being. I'm not sure if you know this or not, tongue in cheek, but Jesus is not your personal superhero. Did you know that? Jesus is not, did not come so that you can climb tall mountains and, and do whatever you want and, 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 and kind of have access to more resources and more power and more prestige. Jesus did not come to give you your best life now, to quote a heretical theologian from Texas. That's not what Jesus came for. Jesus came to die. Now, I want you to catch the next sentence, because this really is how the gospel takes root. Jesus came to die, and our life, our hope, our meaning, our purpose, our identity is found in dying with him. Not in conquering, not in succeeding, not into excelling. Our hope, our life, our purpose, our identity are found in dying with Christ. That's the message of the scriptures. That to be God's people means that we find our everything in Christ's death and resurrection. You, my brothers and sisters, are called to die. To die in your baptism. Most of you have been baptized. That's the first time you die. And from then forward, to die daily to yourself, to your wishes, to your wants, to your culture. You are called, and I am called, to die with Christ. That our life is bonded to him and his will for us, to his ways for us. I, I love how quiet this room got when I started talking about dying with Jesus because that sits a little rough on us sometimes, doesn't it? That, that, that's not what we want. No, we want to excel with Jesus. We want to thrive with Jesus. We want to be comforted with Jesus. In other words, we want to take the focus off of who Jesus actually was and we want to put the focus on us. But that's not the message of Scripture. That's not the gospel. The gospel that we see most clearly in these four books of the gospels all leads to a cross. All leads to a death. That's the Christian life. That's the weird, awkward, doesn't make sense to us, upside downness of the gospel. Is that if you want life and hope and meaning and purpose and identity, it's not found in thriving, it's found in dying. Every day. To sin, to self, to self interest. That's the gospel. And then what God does with that, God takes this broken, sinful, dying people and he wraps them in the beauty of the gospel, the beautiful righteousness of Christ. And he teaches us what it means to move forward as his people, not seeking our own interests and our own desires, but realizing that his way is better, even when it's unpopular or difficult or maybe even painful. God spins us and reorients our worldview. He reorients everything about what it means to be his people. 
wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Here's my cliffhanger. But, but to work that all the way through, you have to come back next week. Because <laughs> next week we go to the next genre, the epistles, where, where we get to see how this life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, this upside-downness of the gospel changes everything for God's people. It institutes a new covenant and a new normal, a new everything rooted in sacrificial death. It reorients community. It reorients outreach. It reorients everything that God has called his people to be and to do, to trust and to put their trust in. But for that, you got to come back next week. For today, we content ourselves in the beautiful richness of the gospel. And maybe, just maybe, we, we push beyond our tendencies to turn it into some token. Maybe, just maybe, we push through our tendencies to reduce the gospel to some feel-good magic pill. And we realize that the gospel is far richer and far more beautiful and far more complex than we could imagine. I actually had dinner with somebody this weekend and, and we were sitting late in the evening and they said, Pastor, I've been reading through the gospels and Acts and, and I'm realizing that much of my assumptions about the Christian life are wrong. That actually this way of living according to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus looks radically different than what I've kind of trained myself to think it looks like. What would you say to that, Pastor? I'm not going to answer that question. What would you say to that, church? Because if Jesus looks like an add-on to the rest of your life, you're absolutely missing the gospel. Jesus isn't an add-on to your everyday normal life. Jesus is a complete reorientation of the way that you see the world. That, my friends, is the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks that you came in the flesh, that you walked among us, that you fulfilled the perfect expectations of the law, that God, in your death, You've opened the doorway to new life. But, but ironically, that new life is tied to death. It's tied to us dying with Christ. That we may also be raised to new life with him. God, it, it, it's, it's what your entire scriptures speak to. It, it speaks to the coming of Jesus and, and the need to die. That, that God, somehow you've always had this plan to set aside a special people for yourself. That, that you wanted to work through and you wanted to walk with and you wanted to change. Lord, you declared us to be the salt of the earth. And we certainly don't want to lose our saltiness. And so God made the gospel not only provide us eternal comfort as we hope in what will happen beyond death. But may the gospel reorient the way that we live and think and process reality today. That God, we might die to sin and self and we might live with Christ Jesus. God, thanks for the hope that we have because of Jesus. Thanks for the hope that we have because of the gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.